right away because I know you're all very excited. At least it sounds like you're very excited. <laughs> um, first off, before I even I get started and welcome all of you, I, I hope none of you sat on your pens, but you all have a gift from the five libraries that for the last six years now have been coordinating the community read. So we are the Neighborhood Library Association. Uh, this is just a small token of our appreciation for the support that we have been getting from all of you in the last six years. And if you've noticed, we even now have a banner that shows who we are and the six, uh, the five libraries that um, bring this all together for you. So, my name is Julie Farkas. I'm the director of the Novi, of the Novi Public Library. I welcome all of you tonight to this event. We always are so excited about this opportunity. We, you know, bring out our books in August. And it seems so far away when we bring out our books. And I know that we had over 100 books circulating uh, between the five libraries um, over the last few months. But and now here we are. You know, the moment is finally here where we get to introduce all of you to what I think is a wonderful and amazing author. So um, I have a few thank yous. And I, I hope you don't mind um, me just saying a few things before we get started. But this is our sixth an annual community read. Um, we've had some fabulous authors and you know every time you leave uh, this, this room every year we hear how are you going to top that one and we also think the same thing and we struggle in the winter time but I think each year we produce and, and bring you a great author and I think we've done that again tonight. Um, I'd like to introduce the directors of the five libraries that are part of the Neighborhood Library Association. So from the North Hill District Library I have Julie Heron. South Lyon District Library is Doreen Hannon. The Lyon Township Library is Holly Teasel. And the, Wixom, and the Wixom Public Library is Cindy Mack. These, these are my partners in crime. So, um, and then we have a wonderful committee. So not just the directors, but a fabulous committee of people that I'm going to ask to stand and wave and um, uh, say hello to you because they really do work very hard reading um, for many months trying to figure out what is going to be that great title that we're going to bring to you each year. So I'd like to introduce to you Mike Postula, who's in the back, <laughs> Jessica Hesselbrave, we have Michelle Fields, Karen Fell. So, um, and the next next group I need to recognize really are the amazing people that have been helping our five libraries over many years. Uh, for the Novi Library, we just celebrated 55 years, and our friends group was started. Our library was started by our friends group. So. These are our ambassadors of our libraries, our friends groups, and they generously support us every year um, with paying of the books for us to bring extra copies to you, publicity, the author's honorarium, um, and, and really building the excitement over the 12 weeks that we do this program for you. So please give a warm applause to our friends of the, no of the Novi Library, the Salem South Lyon District Library, the Lyon Township Library, the Wixom Library, and the Northville Library. They are an amazing group of people who support us each year. to join, you will want to join the friends. So you would be part of this excitement each year. Plus they do a, a lot of wonderful things, I, programming, um, book sales, a lot of support for our libraries um, each year. I also want to thank um, the Baronet Hotel. Uh, they have actually been um, providing the um, hotel nights for Susan Vreeland and they have been wonderful providing her accommodations. Barnes & Noble also provided the books this evening, so there will be signing um, afterwards, and you can purchase a few of the titles that we have chosen for you this evening to, to have and, and to buy. Um, also, Stephen Rockies. We are always enjoy um, this night because we also get to have dinner with the author, and Stephen Rockies has been wonderful to us. So these businesses that um, I'm mentioning, please take a moment to thank them and, and patronize them if you get a chance because they've been great to our libraries. 
Um, I also want to take a moment to thank Bethany Bratney. She's the media specialist over at the Novi High School. And tomorrow morning, Susan will go over and meet with a large group of students, typically English um, students from the English classes, and have a moment to meet the author as well. So it's great that while she's here, we're taking full advantage of her um, meeting with young people and, and also with all of you. I'm so proud to tell you that 955 checkouts happened with this book this year. So that is our second highest. And we also had many wonderful programs with hundreds of people that were in attendance. So um, if you ask me when people say, are, are libraries um, going away, are they becoming extinct? I think the five of us, are, our libraries, could say no way. So we're pretty excited about that. But now to get started, because I know you're not here to hear me speak. So um, Susan says, coming out of the Louvre for the first time in 1971, dizzy with new love, she stood on the Pont Neuf and made a pledge that the art of this newly decorated and discovered world in the old world would be my life companion. Never had history been more vibrant, its voices more resonating, its images more gripping. On that first trip to Europe, she felt herself a pilgrim. She thought even secular places such as museums and ruins were imbued with the sacred. Painting, sculpture, architecture, music, religious and social history, she was swept away with all of it. Wanting to read more, to learn languages, to fill her mind with rich, glorious, long-established culture wrought by human desire, daring, and faith. She wanted to keep a Gothic cathedral alive in her heart. After graduating from San Diego State University, she taught high school English in San Diego, um, retired in 2000 after a 30-year career. Concurrently, she began writing features for newspapers and magazines, taking up subjects in art, and travel and publishing close to 250 articles. She ventured into fiction in 1988 with What Love Sees, a biographical novel of a woman's unwavering determination to lead a full life despite blindness. And since then, she's created eight amazing novels, um, books for all of you to enjoy. Uh, Chicago Sun-Times says, anyone who has been caught under the spell of great art will already understand the wisdom of Reland's fiction. Stark Review by Kirkus says, Vreeland's passionate writing is as good as a private showing at the Louvre. The book's most touching moments intertwine art with human connections. That's book list. It is my great honor to introduce all of you to this evening to Mrs. Susan Vreeland. of silence for our friends in Paris, nos amis en à Paris. Join me and say, Je suis Paris. Je suis
played by the United States Marine Band. <laughs> well, actually, I'm going to uh, begin the program with a poem. This is a literary audience. <laughs> Uh, and it introduces a word that I'd like you to know. I didn't always know it myself. The poem is Musée de Beaux-Arts by W. H. Auden. In it, he describes a painting <coughs> by Bruegel, The Fall of Icarus. And here's a portion of that poem. Can you all hear me? About suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters. How well they understood the human position. How it takes place while someone else is eating, or opening a window, or just walking dully along. In Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had to on the white legs disappearing into the green water. And the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing, a boy falling out of the sky, had somewhere to get to and sail calmly on. The poem again is The Fall of Icarus by W. H. Auden, and as I read it, I was thinking about how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. This poem exemplifies ekphrasis in its most sublime. Ekphrasis, E-K-P-H-R-A-S-I-S. -S. In that it provides interpretation and greater pathos to the painting. So what is this word ekphrasis? It is the act of using one art form, a poem, a play, a novel, a piece of music, to describe, illuminate, or analyze a work of art in another art form a painting, a sculpture, a piece of architecture, etc. Making the original more evocative. Uh, Charles Baudelaire said, arts tend to supplement. Well, without knowing the name for what I was doing, <laughs> I started writing ekphrastic fiction. <laughs> and when I spoke at a university in Connecticut, a professor came up to me afterwards and said, Ms. Vernon, I'm so glad that you're writing ekphrasic fiction. <laughs> 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 I had a clue But I went home, where did I go first? <laughs> to a library! <laughs> And that's where I really learned its meaning. And Baudelaire's quote that uh, arts tend to supplement each other by lending each other new strength and new resources. Well, I began writing that class of stories with three. I wanted to test the waters a little bit because I wasn't at all sure that one, this was new in my career, 
that one could write a piece of fiction using a historic person. Was that against the rules? <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote a story called A Flower for Jeanette about a Monet watercolor painting. And I added nine more stories to make a collection, which is called Life Studies. I suspect that your library has a copy. <laughs> it includes, uh, Life Studies includes The Yellow Jacket, about a young man who posed for a Van Gogh portrait of him. But it's his story, it's not Van Gogh's story. Van Gogh's a minor character in this story. Uh, of these stones is a story that I wrote about uh, a boy throwing figs at Cezanne and at his painting. That's true, you know, it was written by Eric Marie Rilke, Rilke recorded in his book Letters on Cezanne. And that moved me a great deal that this gang of boys would take stones and throw it at this audience. What allowed them to do that? Probably their parents. <laughs> <laughs> Who were outraged that Cezanne was living with a woman to whom he was not married. That gave the boys permission to do this. In their mind, at least, but how powerful words are. Now that I know a high sounding name for what I was doing, <laughs> I felt more legitimate. <laughs> so here we are with uh, the second stage in my development of a classic stories. But it doesn't really involve Tracy Chevalier. She and I did not get together one day and say, Let's start a new literary movement in ours. It's as old, Ephrasis is as old as Virgil's description of the image on Achilles' shield in the Aeneid. So I, I, by reading more, I came to understand that there were two types of Ephrasis. Well, I, I just was on a wing and a prayer by uh, assuming that I could define two types of Etrusas. One would be whole novels or plays devoted to a work of art or an artist as the central character. And I'll give you some examples. You probably know of, of these. Um, 1885, Zola wrote Louvre the masterpiece, the story of a fictional artist combining Monet, Manet, Pizarro, and Cezanne. Cezanne hated the book. <laughs> In the 1940s and 50s, Actress has had another resurgence with Irving Stoll and his, oh, I'm sure you've heard of Lost for Life, uh, about Van Gogh, agony and ecstasy, but Michelangelo, and the depths of glory, maybe you don't know. Pissarro. That started my interest in Pissarro, who is one of the three artists who appeared in this instance. Okay. And then I saw the film. Here's Ekfrasis using a film to elucidate a painting. And the painting is Sunday afternoon on the island of the Grand Jatte. And the name of the movie is Sunday on the Park of Joy. I don't think you saw it. Well, you better go back. The library has got it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, type two expresses. The use of art as an element in a fiction about non-artists. 
main characters, not artists. Which titles is this list? One or two? Or or do? <laughs> do. Uh, so here's some examples of that. Dostoevsky uses a whole line painting to dramatize a crisis of faith. Henry James defines his characters by their responses to paintings. Ian Forrester's English characters in Italy, in Italy learn to see life through the medium of art, which vitalizes their sensuality and capacity to love. Oscar Wilde uses the picture of Dorian Gray to expose the obsession with youth. Proust, in remembrance of things past, two characters, both Swan and Bergot, have a passion for Vermeer's little patch of yellow wall, which puts them in touch with eternity. Ooh. And then in poetry, Ode on a Grecian urn. So here we have myth. And then we have a Greek potter making an ekphrastic piece of pottery in which he has drawn or painted elements of a story. That's a process. But then here along comes John Keats, and he writes a story about the base. That's sort of double a process. <laughs> and then, I bet you know who wrote this, my last duchess. There's my last duchess hanging on the wall, you know, he doesn't say right at the beginning that he killed me. <laughs> Robert Brown. So he, he, he discovered then that um, my method of a process in this list <coughs> is the second, uh, involving non-artists as characters. Well, how did I come to that? Because I was writing novels that dealt with one artist or one painting. <coughs> I began to feel, however, that that approach was too constraining. I wanted to break out from that and write from my own invention sto uh, a story with characters that were not artists but had an appreciation for art. And, and that's kind of how Lizette's list came about. See, it began with this feeling that in terms of my development as a writer, I must not write another novel with so constrained an approach bringing to literary life one artist, part of his biography, expanding it maybe as I did in uh, Lunch on the Boarding Party to his friends and associates. All that approach gave me much joy for about a decade. Readers seemed to like it and kept requesting me to write a book about someone they liked but I've never taken their advice. <laughs> I've always had to find my subject myself. Uh, now, enter a Provence-loving friend of mine, a photographer, who insisted that on a trip with my husband across the south of France, that we stop in a village called Roussillon, which is one of the declared most beautiful villages in France. And 
I was only there for a couple of hours, and it began to rain. All of the colors in the buildings of Russia were variations of ochre. And if you don't know what that is, hold on. <laughs> They're harmonized colors that um, reflect the ochre that was mined and quarried in the area. Oh, uh -oh where is it? There it is. Never mind. I'm not just playing with a deck of cards here. Well, I am playing with a deck. That's not what you think. There's no jacks and keys. It's just color. Color of the ochre of Russia from their um, mines and their uh, corners. So here's sort of the suggestion of the hmm? Is someone calling? <laughs> There were mines where they had mined the ore, the ogre ore, that produced these colors. I thought I had a link to some story that had not been told yet. You know, um, Art history looks at works of art and people who have created them. But what was it called? That exploration of the people who made the things that are the materials of art. The first thing, go back to the Lascaux caves. The first thing is the pigment. Open. The last thing an artist does, after he finishes his canvas, then what does he do? Oh yeah, he signs it. But what else does he do? I'm giving you a hint. He frames it. He frames it. So these two elements, a frame and uh, the original substance, were elements in my story. And I thought I had better have a character that was connected to both. Who am I speaking of? Not an artist. these colors. And then he was tired of that, he asked his boss, I think I can sell more pigments in Paris than you can, because I dug them out of the earth. You know, there's that pride, that the personal connection that we have. So his boss sent him off to Paris, and I do what did he find there? An artist in an art supply store who was weaving. Who was that? Pissarro. I heard it. I heard it. And he was weaving because, if you recall, his daughter had died at age nine. He had no money to pay for the cancer of the grave digger and the, the 
Medal of Honor. And much later, the Medal of Honor of Berlin. So, uh, I, I, I just want to read you one sentence of invective from Hitler. July 1937, on the day of German art. German art. He addressed a huge crowd in Munich, spitting passionate invective against degenerate art, shouting, we will from now on lead an unrelenting war of purification, an unrelenting war of extermination against the last elements which have displaced our, our art. Well, eager to carry out Hitler's orders, a commission of dealers, German dealers, Austrian dealers, set nearly 5,000 works of art ablaze in the courtyard of the Berlin Fire Department. That was just the beginnings. Something had to be done. Okay. However, against this large-scale pillage by German troops and German um, officers, led by German officers, against that large-scale pillage was small-scale theft. Do you know any other book of mine that dealt with small-scale theft of art. <laughs> you know, I was a high school teacher for 35 years. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that taught me how to wait. <laughs> <laughs> the book is. The artist is near. The painting is fictitious. <laughs> but here it is a small scale pillage because a German officer entered a Jewish home in Amsterdam, recognized this gorgeous painting as the premier, sent off the inhabitants to Auschwitz and came back and took the painting. That's in Girl in I've never seen my table. That's okay, that's okay, I'll manage. I'll school. <laughs> so uh, then we have Lisette's List is the story of a single family in the south of France who hid their beloved collection of eight paintings which were certain to have been destroyed as degenerate art if found. Now both of those stories are my invention. You don't think Lisette's List is true. <laughs> but those two stories echo, uh, echo thousands of cases that are true of stolen art. How many of you have seen, uh, is it called the woman or the lady the in gold? <laughs> ah, good, good, good. We have to keep up on these things. So. <laughs> All right, so um, so our history looks at our works and the people who have created them. But what is it called, that exploration of the people, the people's lives who made the things that are the materials of art? The first thing, the paintings. And where did that occur? Now the museum.
due to a lack of simple medications. All supplies having been sent to the Allies on the continent. Thus, she was a victim of war, as surely as any fallen soldier. I want to say to my friends in France that she joins me in this greeting. She who loved France and French art so faithfully, her last joy was the liberation of Paris. Today, the world hopes and believes that the years of struggle will make the content and spirit of French art even more profound, more than ever worthy of the great art ethics of the past. Now, when Paris is liberated, when the art of France is resurrected, the whole world, too, will once and for all be free of the satanic enemies. <laughs> Is it that profession? <laughs> Who wanted to annihilate not just the body, but the soul. The soul without which there is no life, no artistic creativity. May your colors and your creative effort have the strength to bring back warmth and new belief in life, in the true life of France and of the whole world. And one other section that I really like very much is when Maxine, this is the last thing I'll read, Maxine is talking to Lisette, answering her question, what makes great art? That? And she's talking about Chagall. He doesn't pay attention to the law of gravity. But that's what I love in his work. All those creatures flying around as the gravity wasn't the law at all. His vision obeys higher laws, Maxim said. That's spirituality. Most good art has some <coughs> spiritual dimension. Is that what makes a painting great, doesn't it ask? Oh, that's just a start. A great painting has to be more than spiritual, certainly more than a piece of religious art. Let's see. It has to be more than original, too. More than a good likeness more than a beautiful subject painted in pleasing colors, more than an intriguing composition. What more? Well, let me think. A great painting encourages us to feel some connection with a truth. Oh, you're talking riddles. No, no. Great art, painting, sculpture, yes, even architecture allow us to experience times, places, emotions that we might not otherwise encounter. It invites us to ponder some item, a piece of fruit, or a violin floating in the sky, or a marble figure, or a cathedral, until its qualities teach us something or enrich us, or inspire us. It's capable of holding a person in a trance-like state of union with the subject until he sees who he is or who we are as human beings more clearly. A painting can do that? Yes, Lisette, I believe it can being completely absorbed by a piece of art, a person becomes minutely different than he was before, less limited to his previous narrower self. And this equips him to live a better life and to avoid getting swallowed up by the world's chaos. 
Give me an example. I'll take architecture. That German prison guard I told you about must have had such a trance-like experience in his cathedral in Paul, just as I have had many times in Notre Dame. We each love those buildings, their qualities of solidity, soaring power, intricacy, harmony, light, the feeling you have when you stand in them of being enfolded in the arms of God. Because we both wanted to experience each other's cathedral, our longing for those qualities allowed us to transcend enmity. For that moment, we were brothers. It's infinite and powerful. What art can be? One more paragraph and then we're through. <laughs> I promise, I promise, I promise. <laughs> it's my final reason why I write fiction. Interested? <laughs> it's because of its effect on the imagination. Thanks to art, instead of seeing only one world and one time period, our own, we see it multiplied and can peer into other times, other worlds, other sensibilities, which offer a window to other lives. Each time we enter imaginatively into the life of another, it's a small step upward in the elevation of the human race. I'd like to read that sentence again. <clears throat> Each time we enter imaginatively into the life of another, it's a small step upward in the elevation of the human race. When there is no imagination of others' lives, there is no chance for human connection. When there is no human connection, there is no compassion. Without compassion, then community, commitment, loving kindness, human understanding, peace, they all should. Individuals become isolated. And the isolated become resentful. Even blinded. And turn cruel. And the tragic colors expressed as domestic and civil violence. Holocaust and war. Art and literature combined are antidotes to them. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to welcome anyone who'd like to ask a few questions of Susan. Oh, questions, questions. I like <laughs> we, we typically give about 10 minutes, so we'll go to about 10 after 8. So if there's anyone who has a question, we ask that you come up to the microphone so that everyone can hear you. Yeah, okay. good, 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 good. And then after that, we're going to hear the rest of that CD uh, of uh, songs from the rest of Okay, stand right up there. Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> The first book of yours that I read was The uh, uh, Passion of Artemisia, and I'm very curious about what attracted you to her, and why did you choose to write about her story? Yeah. Can you all hear the question? Yeah. yeah. Well, it wasn't her painting where she was cutting off the head of the Assyrian general. <laughs> well, many things connect yeah. Uh, yes, you do, don't you? Pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But the 
It had to do with her um, strings of character to continue painting even in the face of ridicule and scandal. And it has to do with all of the strong female characters that she painted. What else? Yes, please come up quickly. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your writing process. Like, do you write every day? And I know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I know. I bet you wish to write yourself. I mean, that question is asked often. Uh, when I am working on a novel, I spend six months in research taking uh, lots of notes, and then I have to figure out how to index those notes well, so I can find things again. Uh, when I begin writing the novel, I work every day, all day, all evening. That's all I do. <laughs> I don't have any friends. <laughs> And then I begin rewriting. Uh, I, I write a chapter, and I'm not certainly not satisfied with it. It probably has holes in it. So I go back and rework it. Then I work on chapter two, and I do the same thing. But I connect it with chapter one. So I'm here's my loop. It's getting and then I go on to chapter three, and then I connect chapter two and three. Hey, did you, did you play with me, slinkies when you were a kid? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how I write. <laughs> Until I get to the end. That's draft one. Even though each chapter I draft several times. And with Rosette's list, I have 13 drafts. How many are handwritten? No. All keyboarded. All keyboarded, and then I handwrite my uh, edits, and then insert them on the computer. No, key, no taking is handwritten or keyboarded when you do your research. Oh, that's handwritten. Handwritten. Why does that matter? <laughs> Rance and Harris, who just did a study on handwriting uses three parts of the brain and keyboarding only uses one. So I just wondered. All right, so I'm missing out on that part. I'm going to give you an easy question. Um, why couldn't Lizette's husband come back from the war and be found at some point? <laughs> That's an easy question, I'm sure. No, it is not. <laughs> well, I think I want a tragedy in the book. I mean, I'm not a dark person. <laughs> but uh, people like tragedy. <laughs> We like sweet next. We like novels that end sweetly. I don't want to give them that. No. <laughs> Is that a good enough answer? <laughs> well. With your love and appreciation of art, do, are you an artist? No. <laughs> no, my stepdaughter grandfather was. And I watched her paint, and he tried to teach me how to do watercolor. And I liked that, but I didn't follow it. The set had two suitors. At what point while writing the novel did you realize which gentleman she would choose? <laughs> uh, speaking of Bernard. <laughs> Why do I say he's a 
dark hero. Why do I call him a hero at all? He was aggressive to her. Right? That was in a, his time in his life where he was still suffering from his wife's demise and did not, I don't think he knew how to approach a woman or to communicate with uh, So you want to know when I made the decision as to whether Lizette would end up with him? Yes. <laughs> Pretty late in the life. <laughs> Because yeah, yeah. uh, I wanted to kind of surprise myself. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I, I always come down on the side of art, and that scene represented art and music. I can say that he was the dark hero because of what he did to save Ishion, which was, in effect, to put his life in danger as posing as a collaborator. Uh, why do I say he chose? Why did he choose to pose? What was his purpose in pretending to be a collaborator? Huh? Huh? <laughs> it was protecting Lucy on this, uh, Madame says. How was he protecting Lucy on? By pretending to be a collaborator. What had happened in Gord? and in St. Saturn Les Arts, two villages on opposite sides of Roussillon. They had enough people that were identified as working for the Raising Stones, and then they slaughtered the people in the town That's right, that's it. And then they bombed uh, Gore. Yeah. And that's true? Is that true? Or yes, ma'am, it is true. That part is definitely true. And from those historic details, I felt on safe ground to develop a character who uh, used those truths to define himself and what his role was to be. Remember also that at the end of the war, when the Germans, defeated Germans, were walking back across uh, France to Germany. Uh, he was uh, a, a, a despicable Frenchmen were taking pot shots at these Germans after the war was over. I mean, the, the ceasefire was all over. But he stood his ground in front of the line of Germans, unarmed as a sign that they should desist. That's heroism, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know if I can get to the microphone. We can hear you. <laughs> All right. Uh, since you're talking about the interrelationship of different art forms, yes. and I haven't heard you talk a lot about music, and I think about you know, Mazursky's pictures at an exhibition, yeah. and have you considered incorporating music into your discussion of, of art? In a new novel? <laughs> <laughs> I have to return to the drawing now. <laughs> well, I'd like to if I knew more about music. I'd like to. I'm not going to. <laughs> One more question. All right, here's yeah. the last one. Are you working oh, on a new novel? Are you working on Oh, that's an easy question to answer. No. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a hard question. <laughs> one more? There's one lady up here. Okay. Um, in tr 
trying to evoke that sense of what uh, Paris and South of France were like during the occupation? Yes. Did you talk to people who had survived that time? Did you have? Yes. Okay, so you Two people. Okay. Who were residents of Roussillon. One was a farmer. And the other was the aunt of the wife of the baker. I went into the bakery in Roussillon one day and I said, do you know anyone who lived in Roussillon during the, occupa the war and the occupation? She said, yes, my great aunt. She lives across the street. <laughs> the red door. I <laughs> knocked on it. <laughs> and I did and she invited me in and we had a three hour discussion. Susan, thank you so much from all five of our communities of Novi Northville, Salem South Lyon, Lyon Township, and the Wixom Libraries. We, all of us represent five libraries and we're so appreciative of you being here this evening. Um, at this time, we, we're going to ask you to hold a moment in your seat so that we can have Susan come down the aisle and she will be signing and there are books for sale. If you have a book that you would like signed this evening, she will do that for you. On behalf of all five of our libraries, thank you so much for being part of our sixth annual community read, and we hope you have a wonderful evening.